started. Here's one of the things uh, I want to talk about. Buzz Aldrin was the second man on the moon, 20 minutes behind Neil Armstrong, and people kept asking him what it was like for him when he saw this view from the moon. First time anyone in the world had ever seen the earth from an outside perspective. And so I'll turn to a neighbor right now and ask this question to one another, answer it. What would your first impression be of this view if you were one of the first people to ever see it like this? Go. I'll give you a couple minutes. Okay, what did some of you think? How many of you think well, this would be absolutely gorgeous and you would love this view? Raise your hand if this is something that would inspire you. I want you to hear what the second man on the moon thought of this experience. The question says, how does it feel to see the Earth from the moon, you're standing on the surface. What does that feel like for you? You hey, said man. beautiful view, magnificent desolation. Uh, no, he said beautiful. And I didn't think it was beautiful at all. So, but humans from Earth, being here for a long time now, we're able to walk on the surface of this thing. What a magnificent tribute to our progress. But what a heck of a desolate place this is. Mm -hmm. What he said was the words magnificent desolation. Desolation comes from the word de solo, which means abandoned or left alone. So here was nothing that he saw anywhere that made him get inspired except for the fact that, wow, this is huge. Otherwise, he looked at that and he thought, this is not beautiful. This is ugly. And the reason why it's ugly is there's no life anywhere here. Of all the vast universe that he was able to see on the moon, 99.999% of it was desolate. No life. Nothing there. The only part that had life was on that little blue dot right there. And one of the things that, that astronomers have been puzzled with this whole time is when you look at the universe, there is no life anywhere else except here. 99.9999999999% and you have to ask the question why for those of you that that think that there should be life elsewhere one of the things that NASA keeps putting on all over and over is yeah we're all alone you think there's aliens out there well that's a hollywood movie or that's really bad something some website decides to put it out there but the top scientists are telling us from nasa we are all alone there's nothing out there we would have heard radio signals by now in fact some people think because the universe is 13 some billion years old if there was intelligent life and we're here on intelligent life we would have to have the same timeline so it could possibly be i don't know that intelligent life would have happened several billion years earlier and we would never know because now they're extinct or maybe they're gonna be there in the future. But the point is, we are all alone. This is a magnificent desolation. And if the only thing about life is here on Earth, we have a problem. And the problem is this, it's called the finely tuned argument. This is one way to prove God. And let me just say, to be clear, this doesn't prove that Jesus is God. It just proves that God is real, but not necessarily Jesus. It could be a, a different religion. But the point is, in this finely tuned argument that you can prove the existence of God, it starts off with this. The universe provides or possesses these finely tuned conditions that allow intelligent life to happen. Without this design life wouldn't happen. So this design is either due to chance or design. And the odds are impossible. You're going to see that for chance to happen, for all this to take place, it's impossible. And so therefore, the fine tuning of the universe points to a designer, a God that, that, that put it all into place. Again, this could be another religion that does this, but we're trying to say that there's no such thing as atheism 
That is, you're going to see it's almost impossible uh, based off of how this all works. And I will tell you, too, that trying to prove God, most of us, the problem that we don't believe in God usually isn't up here. And so we can tell you the arguments. It's usually here. We don't want to believe God because we want to live our own life. We want to do things our way. Some of us, maybe about 10 to 20 percent of you, it is a mental thing. But I'd say most, I, I've been pastoring a long time, most people do not want to follow Jesus. It's a heart issue, not up here. And you take a look at the Pharisees. Jesus was able to do all these miracles in front of people. He raised dead people back to life. He was able to heal people. And even the Pharisees wouldn't believe. Why? Heart issue, not up here. We're going to tell you the reasons up here, but I'm telling you that most of you, the reason why you, if you ever doubt, doubt is not necessarily up here. It's a heart problem. But uh, let's talk about this finely tuned argument for a second. Some atheists will even admit that this is a problem. And Professor Anthony Flew said, although I once was sharply critical of this argument to, of design, I have since uh, come to see that this argument is a persuasive case for the existence of God. Professor Sir Fred Hoyle, one of the top uh, physics professors in the 1950s and 60s, says nothing has shaken my atheism as much as this discovery that everything in the universe was finely tuned to perfection. What is the argument? This. From galaxies and stars, down to atoms and subatomic particles, the very structure of our universe is determined by these numbers. These are the fundamental constants and quantities of the universe. Scientists have come to the shocking realization that each of these numbers has been carefully dialed to an astonishingly precise value, a value that falls within an exceedingly narrow, life-permitting range. If any one of these numbers were altered by even a hair's breadth, no physical, interactive life of any kind could exist anywhere. There'd be no stars, no life, no planets, no chemistry. We're going to look at the stars today. And as we look at the stars, you're going to see King David once was staring at the stars and he had this light bulb moment that just went on. David was the famous king of Israel about 1000 BC. And this was the same David that slayed Goliath, and he cut off his head. And one day, David was looking out at the stars. This could have been when he was your age as a shepherd boy, being outside, tending sheep. Maybe it was as a grown adult. But as he's staring at all these stars, he was completely overwhelmed. And maybe one of the stories that popped in his head was, there's also once a long time ago, a story by the guy named Abraham, and he couldn't have children. And God, he tells God, who promised him that he was going to have a child, God, you didn't leave me with anyone. How am I supposed to have an inheritance to give to anyone? God says, go outside and take a look at the stars. Count them if you can. So shall your offspring be. So staring at stars is something that Jewish people would have done and just imagine God's promise that one day, one guy named Abraham and Sarah would have had an offspring of that many stars. And so King David would have done the same thing. He would have known that story. But maybe he's staring at the stars and overwhelmed just by how huge and massive everything is. Maybe he would have had a whole different impression. Most of you are city kids. You don't get views like this. You don't see stars like this unless you go out of the city. If someone takes you out of the city, then you can notice, wow, that's how many stars there are. Maybe, maybe uh, 200 billion is what they say, but, but on a night sky in LA, maybe we can see 20. And King David had this thought. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, when I see the stars, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place, what is man or woman that you are mindful of him or her and the son of man or woman that you care for him? And so David had this thought, all these stars, God is so high, God is way up there. Why does he even care about me? He's staring at this vast universe. And the same God of the universe treats you higher than he treats everything that he sees there. 
and he says, you have set your glory, God, way above the heavens. I'm staring at this, and your glory is somewhere up there. I can't even imagine what that is like. The word glory is something that's high, and God has set it high above that. And then King David also then says, yet you have made humans, you and me, a little lower than those heavenly beings, and you crowned us with glory and honor. This king that has glory up there somehow gives all of us some amount of glory and honor. Why would he do that? You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. Why in the world of all the places you take a look around life, why did he make humans special? Why did he make humans to understand who he is and to do scientific discoveries and to figure out all of God's revelations? All the sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the heavens, fish of the sea, whatever along the paths of the sea, they are submitted to human beings. We are the ones that are crowned with glory and honor, and he enters into a time of worship. O oh Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. How high is your name? And so the argument that, that David is going to have in this is, how is God majestic and glorious and high? First, his glory is high, and nobody can understand it. Second point, he says, is God set these astrophysical laws in place with the universe, with the stars, and yet he still cares about every single one of you. He has given you his image. And so therefore, as beautiful as that is, God finds you even more stunning. And then God allowed you and me to have some of this glory, which is strange. Of all the places in the universe, this little itty speck, of this planet that has all this life, God allowed that because it's like he wanted to create something that had life. He wanted to create you. He wanted to create me. And you've got to ask these questions why? Now, I want to show you how awesome God is, that if you look at the stars, I'm, I'm going to tell you some of these scientific things that the other scientists have said. Uh, some are atheists. This is not, I am definitely not a scientist, so I can't understand half of this stuff, but I'm telling you what they have said. And so, so Professor Stephen Hawking, who is an atheist himself, he said that the laws of science contain many fundamental numbers that seem to have been very finely adjusted to make the possible development of life. In other words, if you take a look at how science acts, if you just mess with science just a little bit, there would be no life. It's like God purposely calibrated everything to perfection. Those of you that understand robotics and programming, you know one thing that's off, and there goes your program. And God has it fine-tuned perfectly. There's one guy who wrote just six numbers. And he is a cosmologist, and he's able to say, with just six of these numbers, this is a recipe for the universe. And if the outcome is so sensitive that if any of them were to be untuned, you mess with one of these scientific formulas, which are really, really simple, if you mess with it just a little bit, there would be no stars, no life. Is this tuning a coincidence? Did any of this happen by chance? That's his point. And he is an atheist. Or is it providence of a creator? And so let's look at physics. There are two numbers that have to do with the Big Bang of the... Whoops. Two numbers that have to do with the Big Bang of the universe. One is called this gravitational constant. Every single thing has gravity. So you have gravity. You and the Earth have gravity, and the larger something is, the more gravitational force it has that it's going to attract something. So that's why the Earth and you have gravity together. So the mass of the Earth, the formula is really, really simple. You take the mass of one thing, you take the mass of another, which would be the Earth, you multiply it together, and then you divide it by the radius squared. But then you also have to multiply it by what is called the gravitational constant. And that is, 6.67 times 10 to the negative 11. Notice how small that number is. That number is so infinitesimally small that you have to multiply it when you have the mass together. So that's why when you multiply 0 0.0000067 to your mass, you're not gonna attract too many things. But you take Jupiter, you take stars, 
When you have it together, you see a massive force coming together. Now, if you took this number and you just made it 0.668 or 0.666, and you just mess with it just a little bit, you would have a problem, a massive problem, because this gravitational constant then, imagine the Big Bang, as soon as the Big Bang took place, what the scientists are saying is if you made gravity just a little bit stronger, all that matter, all those stars, all those planets that went boom, at some point, they would have to come back together and the universe would shrink back into a black hole and it may take billions of years, but it would stop accelerating, it would decelerate and come back together because of gravity. On the other hand, if you made it weaker, then it would just completely accelerate this universe big bang until it was like a car that without brakes and you wouldn't have planets formed, you wouldn't have stars formed because everything would just keep on shooting out. And maybe you can understand it this way. Consider gravity, for example. The force of gravity is determined by the gravitational constant. If this constant varied by just one in 10 to the 60th parts, none of us would exist. To understand how exceedingly narrow this life permitting range is, imagine a dial divided into 10 to the 60th increments. To get a handle on how many tiny points on the dial this is, compare it to the number of cells in your body or the number of seconds that have ticked by since time began. If the gravitational constant had been out of tune by just one of these infinitesimally small increments, the universe would either have expanded and thinned out so rapidly that no stars could form and life couldn't exist, or it would have collapsed back on itself with the same result. No stars, no planets, and no life. Or consider the expansion rate of the universe. This is driven by the cosmological constant, a change in its value by a mere one part in 10 to the 120th parts would cause the universe to expand too rapidly or too slowly. In either case, the universe would again be life prohibiting. When we look at the heavens and the moon and the stars, what is humanity that God is mindful of him or her? What I'm trying to show you is that in an atheist world, it's almost impossible because of those fine tuning arguments, fine tuning values. How did that take place? If you see scientific laws, that usually means there's a law giver. Somebody put those fundamentals into place and it's got to be God. Even atheist scientists like Stephen Hawking realized this is crazy that this would happen. Now there's another group of scientists that wrote a book called The Privileged Planet. And let's take a look in now into astronomy from physics. One of the things that they've discovered is that if you want to have a planetable or a, a, a habitable earth that where people can live in, you have massive amounts of galaxies, 200 billion galaxies out there. Not every planet is able to host life. In fact, if the planet was a little bit too close to the center, it wouldn't be able to live because there would be way too many stars. If there's too many stars now, the orbit of the planets go a little crazy. The gravitational pull of those stars gets denser and denser and all the heat and the light, you just wouldn't be able to live if a planet was there. On the other hand, if the planet was a little bit too far out, they noticed that the planets there don't have as much of the heavy elements, such as iron, uh, I think beryllium, um, that just wouldn't be possible either. Magnesium, silicon, and oxygen. What it takes is to have a planet that is in the galactic habitable, habitable zone, which is that small red ring. A planet has to be there, and oh, by the way, Earth just happens to be there if you want to have life. Anything far too out, nothing. It's gotta be around a star, and if the planet's not around a star, no life. Is this by chance that the Earth happens to be there in the red spot, but not in the middle, and not out here? They also said that in the privileged planet, that other things that would take place, excuse me about this mic, is that a solar system has to have large planets, and the large planets like Jupiter and Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, one of the things they do is they act as a shield for all these asteroids that are coming in. Is that by chance? One of the other things in the privileged, privileged planet that they said is that when you look at even in the solar systems, 
uh, habitable zone. Each sun has to have something that you can only live in. In that green area, it has to be a planet. If it's too close to the star, no life. Too far away from the star, it's too cold. No life again. And then you look at the moon. The Earth is one of the rare planets with a moon that size as a ratio compared to the planet. Other places like Jupiter's got plenty of moons, but nothing the size of our moon in relation to the size. So the moon is about a quarter of the diameter of the Earth. And what that means, and, and here's how they said it, less than 10% of planets actually have a moon this size. Um, it's really rare in the universe. What the moon does is it actually provides a tilt for the planet, for the Earth. So because the moon is rotating at an angle, it gives the Earth that tilted axis of 23 point something degrees. Without that, what you find is that the Earth then wobbles way more. If the Earth wobbles, well then some summers might be winter, and then some winters might be summer. It would be massively chaotic. You take a look at Mercury, doesn't have a moon. Mercury does not rotate. And because it doesn't rotate, one side is always getting baked by the sun, the other side is always night and freezing. Venus has no moon, and it rotates actually going up and down, not side to side, which is kind of weird. The Earth has a moon at the right size, at the right place, and that causes the Earth to spin, and it causes us to have predictable, fine-tuned days of about 24 hours with seasons. Without that moon, nothing would be like the way we have it right now. The other thing that you find about the moon because of the size and the distance is it causes these rising tides in the ocean and what that allows is nutrients to be moved from the water to the land back to the water again. If the moon were farther from the earth, less tides, less life, and somehow the moon is just perfectly located at the right distance for our planet to make life even more fruitful. And then you look at the earth, we have the right oxygen to nitrogen ratio. If it was larger, then we would, we would live too quickly, we would die. If it's too smaller, we would die slowly. There's just amount of right water, 71%. If there was too much water, then we would have, uh, and you actually have a lot of planets that are 100% water or 0% water. You don't find them that are just in the middle at 70% water. And that allows us to deal with and actually have life. So when you see the universe, you see all these scientific laws. One professor optimis optimistically guessed that the Milky Way would have dozens and dozens, one million advanced civilizations. We have yet to find one. We're it. That should bug us. Because if you don't believe in God, why is it that only this planet has life. Nowhere else will you find it. Everything else is a wasteland, a magnificent desolation. Pluto is all ice. You can't live anywhere else. Nothing else can think about things. So imagine a world without God. This is what they believe. Life was born out of nothing living. The Earth, at one point, was what they call a soup. It was just a liquid, and it cooled off from all the magma. And the belief is, without a god in the scientific community, most people don't believe in a god. They believe that a single cell just happened to live and was born out of a rock, out of something. And then that single cell then replicated, and now you have two. And then they multiplied, and now you have four. And somehow, after millions and millions of years of having all this bacteria without God in place, then the bacteria then went from that into something a little more complex, into fish, into birds, and everything evolved slowly. I'm not, at this church, we're not pro-evolution, we're not anti-evolution. I myself, I don't know how it happened. I, I don't believe God created everything in six literal days, but I'm not sure how God did create things. But just to kind of give you an idea of the atheist belief that something came from bacteria and it was just able to live, there's a problem with that, a massive problem. And that problem is DNA. And this guy by the name of Stephen Meyer wrote a book called Signature in the Cell. DNA shows you something else about finely tuned that could not have just happened by chance. In 1953, James Watson and Francis Crick mapped out the structure of the DNA molecule. 
Along the interior of their famed double helix, they discovered a four-character code at work. They soon realized that sequences of precisely positioned chemicals, called nucleotide bases, store and transmit the assembly instructions, the information, for building the crucial protein molecules that cells need to survive. No protein molecules, no life. Crick later proposed that the chemical constituents in DNA function like letters in a written language or digital symbols in a computer code. Just as well-functioning computer code depends upon precise sequences of zeros and ones, so too does the function of the DNA molecule depend upon the specific arrangement of chemical bases along the spine of the double helix. Famed biotech specialist Leroy Hood describes the information stored in DNA as digital code. Even Richard Dawkins has acknowledged the machine code of the genes is uncannily computer-like. But where did this information, this digital code, come from? It's the problem of getting life from non-life. Why is this a problem? There is simply too much information in the cell to be explained by chance alone. The probability of generating a section of DNA code capable of building just one functional protein by chance is vanishingly small, even taking into account the multi-billion year history of the universe. And even the simplest living cells require hundreds of proteins. DNA functions like a software program. We know from experience that software comes from programmers. We know that information, whether inscribed in hieroglyphics, written in a book, or encoded in a radio signal, always arises from an intelligent source. Without God, how does DNA get created? Those of you that do coding, does code write itself? Does life just happen to live by itself? This DNA is so complex that it doesn't just evolve. That's not possible unless someone designed it. That's the whole point of this finely tuned argument is that without God, you can't possibly have. It's not as easy as just a single bacteria that decides to live. And oh, why, by the way, it happens to have DNA in it already that is more complex than any program we've ever written before. When there is something complex, you have to understand somebody wrote it, somebody programmed it, somebody designed it, and that person is Jesus. Yet you have made humanity a little lower than the heavenly beings, King David says, and you've crowned him with glory and honor. You and I get to have dominion. So you got two choices. For those of you that are doubting and struggling, I get it. We've all been there. We all understand what doubts are like. You have two choices, though. You can look at the universe and you can say, this was by chance. One in a million, 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 trillion, 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 trillion chance that we just happen to get lucky that there's life. Or somebody designed it. And if somebody designed all of this, who is that designer? Nowhere else in the life, in the universe, have we found life yet. It's a magnificent desolation, and the probability of finding life is almost impossible. That's what these scientists are saying. For some of you, if you haven't followed Jesus yet, let's just be honest. Some of our doubts, it's not up here. Some of the doubts is you just don't want to give your life over to Jesus yet. Jesus loves all of us, and he wanted to create this world for us, and he didn't have to, but he was so filled and overflowing with love that he wanted you. He wanted to make this, because he wanted a relationship with you, and he gave you all these signs everywhere in life for you to understand who he is and that he exists. The chances that you're here, the chances that life is here on this one planet out of the whole vast universe is downright impossible.